Hi everybody, my name is Danica Joan and welcome to Custody Matters Live. I have with me Anne O'Keefe and I also have Mark Ludwig. Mark Ludwig is, is the founder of Americans for Equal Shared Parenting. He's been doing a lot of hobnobbing and uh, really creating some awareness with our elected officials. Welcome, Mark. Ah, thanks so much for having me on, and, and thanks for everything you do, too. I mean, we've just got a great community uh, of leaders in the shared parenting community, and you are a, uh, a definitely valued asset in our community. Thank you. Thank you. It's, you know, I am, <clears throat> excuse me, one thing that I'm really present to is the fact that we have so many different advocates, and we've all been on a long journey, all working separately. And yet this last year, we're all coming together. We're all coming together in unity for a unified cause. And we all come from different, different walks of life, different viewpoints and so forth. Speaking of different viewpoints, you just recently went to a conference. Um, and tell us about this conference. Uh, yeah, it was the uh, annual CPAC event. Uh, you know, I've, I've been involved in the political arena for about 30 years, uh, ran for U.S. Congress and, and been very active in politics. So I've been going to these conferences for years. And as I've been saying the last few years, unfortunately, we keep talking to the, preaching to the choir. We keep talking to people within the community. And what I've always said is we need to get people who are outside our community aware. And the easiest way to do that is political events where people are already tuned to political topics and just try and latch our topic on. And we need to do it on both sides of the aisles. Every once in a while, I get attacked by people that say, you know, this should be a bipartisan issue. And I don't think they understand there's a difference between bipartisan and nonpartisan. Bipartisan means there's two major parties. Therefore, you need to engage with both parties. Nonpartisan means you ignore both parties. Well, it it, to ignore both parties is not going to get us anywhere if we want legislation passed. We need to engage both parties. Now, I tend to have a lot of connections on the conservative spectrum, uh, so I've got an in there, but I fully support and, and look for, matter of fact, we need someone that has the connections that I have on the other side of the aisle, because what we need is the two of us talking behind the scenes, doing the same thing at both parties. So unfortunately, I think people get confused and they think, oh, because they're going to conservative events, that means we're alienating the other side of the aisle. And, and my attitude is, no, it's like co-parenting. We need both sides of the aisle. It's equal shared uh, advocacy, if you will. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you have a relationship with the mother doesn't mean you ignore the relationship with the father. The fact that you have the relationship with the Republicans doesn't mean you want to alienate the Democrats. You want both parties engaged. You don't want CPS taking and taking the, the child away from both parents. We need both parents co-parenting. So that's sort of what we're doing. It just so happens I've got a lot of connections with CPAC because of all the, uh, the people I've built friendships with over the past 30 years. But it, it's, it's the single largest gathering of conservative leaders in the country. And uh, to give you an idea, the president was there. And once again, I don't care if people like him or hate him, doesn't matter. If you want to get legislation passed at the federal level, it would be a pretty unwise move to ignore who was ever in the White House on either side of the aisle. But, uh, you know, the president was there, the vice president, uh, well over half of the members of the cabinet were there. Um, I personally had meetings with 27 members of Congress, and I know there were others there besides the ones I met with. So it was a pretty, pretty concentrated uh, gathering of these people. That's awesome. You know, that really makes a difference. You know, I am proud of having someone that's speaking, uh, who's a voice for us in all the elected, um, all of the branches of, the, of government. Because if we don't get out there and, and speak to these people and you know, extend an olive branch, how are we gonna make any difference at all? I mean, I can talk to all of my friends about my situation and they'll all be in agreement, but that won't make any changes. Exactly. Um, in the situation. <clears throat> and what so, we need is people engaging that know how to speak their language. Because uh, you're going to talk very differently to a Republican than you will to a Democrat. Republicans are more concerned about family values, due process, things like that. Democrats are more concerned about fairness, equality, uh, things like that. So you're going to have a very different discussion. 
So you need someone who's had the background to, to articulate the art and the science of getting our message across. But it, as people know, LaShawn Ford, who's on the opposite side of the aisle, the one that ran for mayor of Chicago. Uh, LaShawn and I have a great uh, friendship and he is a phenomenal champion of ours on the Democrat side. Unfortunately, uh, he's very busy with his duties in the uh, Illinois legislature. So he doesn't have the time Man, I would love to have him in D.C. Because I'll tell you what, he is, he knows what he's doing. He is just a phenomenal, I was, I was really wanting him to be mayor of Chicago. He came, he had a darn good shot at it. And, uh, but like I said, we need people on both sides of the aisle and whoever they are, let's support them. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and this is what it's all about when we're talking about trying to bring healing and uh, to hurting families for the best interest of the children. It's not marginalizing one parent or the other. And we can't in in uh, an, in a government conversation, we can't just marginalize and, and just like kill off one party, um, you know, in favor of another. That's I mean, we're we're all one. We're all one. We're all uh, Americans here. And yeah, well, we, we need the topic heard. discussed at caucus meetings uh, on both sides mm -hmm. of the aisle, because with 434 members of the House and 100 members of the Senate, that's 535 legislators. There's not enough time to meet with all of them and their staffs. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is think strategically, if we can get the caucus discussing it, now we get groups of them instead of one at a time. We get 50, 60, 70 at a time. And so that's how you do that is attending events like this. This is a huge education for people because I know I don't come from an understanding of how legislatures work and how the government works. I mean, my my biggest education was government when you, that you had to take in school and um and this is something that you that you've brought to our community with your organization Americans for Equal Shared Parenting um and what you've created a structure that um is goes into the state level with leaders isn't that right yeah I've, I've always said I don't want us to be I never want anybody to say there's an AFESP bill uh, my goal is to educate, enable, and empower. What we need is a thousand people across the country that are educated and they know what to do because a state doesn't want somebody from out of state telling them how, how their legislation should have. That's you know, when you study the foundations of our republic, one of the big keys they wanted was the state's rights. And so it helps to have people come in that are, they, they use the word experts. I don't think I'm an expert in any way, but they, they like to, to quote experts but they want people of that state doing the work. So my goal is to educate people across the country, be a resource for them, and then they're the ones who are gonna do all the work in their state. We're just sort of giving them advice, trying to give them 30 years worth of knowledge in a very short period of time. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. In. Yeah, go Can ahead. I jump in real quick? So um, I'm, I'm privileged to be part of the team with putting on the conference in April. Uh, the Guardians and Gatekeepers Conference, and there's a couple of things here I, I just wanted to cover real quick. Um, to be able to work with a team of individuals from all over the country, really, to put this event on, it's, it's going to be amazing. It's going to serve the purposes that you're talking about as far as pulling together in a nonpartisan way, nonpartisan, bipartisan, whatever, apolitical, apolitical way. The, the gathering of the professionals and the parents at this conference in April, it's going to be huge. So Danica and I today covered a lot of ground to get the, the, the groundwork laid for a phenomenal event that's really just gonna to bring together some wonderful people to push the cause forward at the legislative level at the professional level of both mental health, uh, legislatively, um, and then at the parental support level. Because having that, that type of event where we're gonna have both parents and professionals there, it's, it's going to be amazing. Yeah, I'm excited to, to be a part of it. A neat event, I think some of you know, we've been for three years doing events specifically geared for legislation. So we don't really get into the mental health aspects at all. And ours aren't really geared to parents, they're geared to the people that do the legislative activity. Mm -hmm. And we, we've been partnering with about 80 groups now around the country over the last three years, but ours is very narrow focused. So I love what you guys are doing is broadening the, you know, the, the scope 
of areas that we don't touch on. Uh, so many times people think groups are in competition. There's no competition, there's collaboration. And each of us has an area of expertise. You know, I, unfortunately, I always give baseball analogies because I used to, I was horrible at it, but I did play. <laughs> but, uh, you know, on a, on a baseball team, you know, you don't want everybody running to the pitcher's mound to try and pitch. You better hope somebody's playing first base and catcher in the outfield. And that's the beauty of things like with what you guys are doing. We complement each other and work very, very well together because you guys provide a niche that I'm not educated in. I, you know, I have no background in mental health whatsoever. So you wouldn't want me even remotely facilitating anything like that. Uh, so it helps to have people like you guys that can help facilitate a totally different area that we need filled in this community. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to, to play my small role in what you guys are doing uh, down there. I think it's a key because I think when um, I jumped into the work about 20 years ago, um, we barely understood, people really barely even understood the term parental alienation and much less even being able to recognize it when you even, when you distinguished it for people. So it was kind of a voice in the wilderness. We were always trying to explain what is parental alienation? What does it look like? And, and why is the way that we're doing things now, like teachers in the schools and, and in the courtrooms, how is it really hurting the children? Now they have a better understanding of how it is. And the missing, what's been missing is a person like yourself who can educate people on making a difference on a legislative uh, level. So it's gonna be great having you at the conference because uh, you can enlighten people on how they can get involved. I mean, it is their government that, um, and they can make a difference. Mm -hmm. And we've, you know, that's what's so neat about it. I've been doing this tour around the country for the last couple of years. And I just, one of the neatest things that just gets me inspired is all the great leaders around the country that are working on all these bills in so many different states and uh, so many great people. We just need more people uh, rising up. And, and as I said, most people, the reason is they think, well, I don't have a background. Well, fortunately, legislation is a skill. So it's not talent-based, it's skill-based, which means we can teach you you know, yeah, there's going to be some art and science. So the art part will take a while, but I can teach people the science. I can teach them the basics of how to engage legislators, uh, you know, how to frame the narrative, how to talk to legislators on the Republican side versus the Democrat side, uh, how to talk differently in a state that has term limits versus a state that doesn't have term limits. So uh, like I said, that kind of stuff can be taught if people have the desire. And once again, the big key is we want people that that's their interest. Uh, what we don't want is if someone's interested in, in mental health uh, or parental alienation or other aspects, I don't wanna try and pull them in and say, no, you need to work with us. I want people to say, you know what? I, I like what you're doing with Americans for Equal Shared Parenting. I wanna engage legislatively. That's what I'm looking for because we wanna fit people in their role. Uh, if somebody was a better fit somewhere else, I'm truly honored if they would just say, you know what, Mark, will you support what you're doing? But this isn't my role. My role is over here. Because like I said, there's a bunch, there's like 12 different avenues we need to be attacking the, the animal at. Mm -hmm. I get it. I get it. And um, you sent me some texts before our, um, before right now, and it had something to do with some exciting things happening in Missouri. Would you like to share that? Yeah, Missouri can't give all the details because uh, ironically, what was, it was funny. Um, I was being quoted uh, on the floor today of the Missouri Senate <laughs> and uh, by the opposition. And uh, so we do want to wait uh, to reveal too many details um, because it literally right now it is on the floor in the Missouri Senate. That's why I keep checking my phone here is I'm getting messages from members of the Senate. But uh, yeah, this is a pretty exciting day for Missouri. Uh, what we've been trying to do is uh, there is no golden bill. Uh, legislation is a process. And normally what you need to do is, is you do a small bill to slowly turn the ship. And then either you or another state will try and get another bill that, that moves it a little farther, and then a little farther, and a little farther. And uh, Kentucky did a great job a couple of years ago, twofold. Number one, their temporary orders that they did was genius, Bill, uh, because that immediately turned the ship, showing the direction. Uh, then they followed that up with their rebuttal presumption bill, uh, which was once again beautifully uh, orchestrated. Unfortunately, the only small side note was they allowed an amendment. Uh, which allows for some of the unethical attorneys to take advantage in a few situations. Still, it was a great bill, 
but as I say, we still need other states to come on and, and add on to that. And then another state to come on and add on to that. Well, uh, this morning on the floor of the Senate, uh, they tried adding an amendment very similar to the one that was added in Kentucky. And uh, the one that we were really afraid, because they've been trying to do this in Missouri every year. And uh, you know, our attitude is we need to move the ball a little farther. So we'd rather have a bill without the amendment. Well, uh, just about uh, 45 minutes ago, uh, they tried adding the amendment on and it was killed on the Senate floor. So now, that's not a home run yet. There's still a lot more to go. But uh, what they tried doing is something where one instance of abuse could be enough to rebuke the entire rebuttal, rebuttable presumption. The challenge is the standard of evidence. So technically, somebody could be, you know, standing and blocking the door and the non-custodial parent moves them out of the way so they can get out the door. They file a restraining order saying this person abused me. That's all it takes then in many states to rebut the presumption. We added an extra line this year that said you needed to have a proven pattern of evidence, meaning that there had to have been some kind of standard and not just one instance can throw it out. Otherwise, an attorney could coach their client to say, hey, next time they come over, this is what I want you to do. I want you to stand in front of the door. I want you to get video footage of them moving you. That rebuts the presumption. So we have a standard of evidence now and a pattern. And uh, they were trying to take that out with their amendment. And it was just, I, it was so exciting to see. Uh, we finally forced them to do a, a roll call. And uh, we got the amendment taken away uh, by a 9 to 21 vote. So that means the pattern of abuse stands. Uh, so it's going to take more than just a simple allegation to throw the, now, like I said, we're still not through the woods yet. Uh, we're still coming back. Uh, the bill is still being perfected uh, at this point. And then after perfection, they still have the vote on the final verbiage of the bill. So got a ways to go. But this was a, for people who understand legislation, this was a huge home run so far, what's happened in the last hour. You know, it's, it's really it's tough to understand what the impact is on on a bill, especially when it's being presented and sold to you by the person who, that's that's supporting it. Um, like in the state of Florida, <clears throat> we tried to get like twice tried to get a 50-50 uh, timeshare um, bill passed, and it just kept it. Uh, I guess it's gone for the for this year. We tried to do it a few years ago, and it was squashed. Um, and actually some organizations that I really respect a lot of the members in were just really downing the 50-50 timeshare. Um, I don't understand it. I don't understand um, why, but uh, when, you re when you listen to what they said and their reasons for it, you're like, and you and you didn't have any other clue. You'd like, oh yeah, I don't want fighting with the, I don't want the child to suffer if this bill passes and stuff. And and it was my perspective that the bill would actually correct things for the child so that the child yeah, child is not caught in the middle. A couple of years ago, that the governor uh, vetoed. Um, the whole country was excited about that. That was a great bill, actually, passed with overwhelming support in both chambers. Mm -hmm. and then uh, got vetoed. Um, a lot of speculation, I won't give my personal opinion, but there was some speculation uh, that, that the Governor Scott was using that so that the Bar Association wouldn't attack him in his run for the U.S. Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was basic, and that kind of stuff happens a lot, and, and not necessarily a totally bad thing, um, you know, because you have to realize if someone truly wants to get legislation passed, they have to get elected. And so, on both sides of the aisle, that kind of stuff happens, that there's trade-offs. Now, this year's bill in Florida still technically isn't dead. There's still some maneuvers that can take place. And that's why it helps, too, to have people who have been through the process that can teach people. There's still strategies that can be used until the session is over. There's always ways of tacking bills on to other bills at the last second and getting bills passed. So what we did in Missouri in, in uh, 2016. People thought our bill was, was dead. It wasn't dead. We got it thrown on at the last second and uh, got it passed. Now, that was a facts, findings, and conclusions bill. But there's some definite strategies that can still be implemented in Florida to get that bill passed in its current form. Wow. And I really, I really hoped for that because um, as it is, even though Florida is a shared parenting state, 
it doesn't, there's nothing that specifically says it's like a no, no guideline that tells the judge, you're going to assume that both parents have equal rights. Yeah, there's a big, big difference between shared parenting and equal shared parenting. And that's why it's critical that we get people always using the verbiage equal shared parenting because shared parenting, technically if someone has 2%, that's sharing. So we need to make sure to tell people, look, don't use shared parenting because if you do, it, it came, matter of fact, it came up twice on the uh, floor uh, today where they tried using that. You know, well, don't we have shared parenting? Well, we did shared parenting. No, no, no. Equal shared parenting is very different. Mm -hmm. Wow. And one of the arguments that this person just sent out in an email blast was, uh, was to try to, um, they were saying that it would actually cause more um, litigation and, and all that and, and the child to suffer. That just doesn't make sense. Why would they say that? They, yeah, they, it's a spin that they try and use. It's, it's almost like those of us in the community know narcissists use projection. And, and that's what the opposition does. They try to project the very thing that they're doing, they try to project on us. And uh, it, you, know, you have to imagine, if somebody walks into a family law attorney's office right now in any state across America, that attorney is going to say, look, you're not going to get 50-50 in our state. One of you is going to win and one of you is going to lose. So unless you want to be the one that loses, I need you to help me dig up dirt to prove why your ex-spouse is a bad parent. And that fuels that adversarial relationship. Imagine the difference if we had 50-50 and that same attorney would say, look, in our state, you're probably going to share 50-50. So unless there's just some unbelievably reason, you're going to need to get to get, learn to get together. But the opposition tries to spin it and say, you know, we're not looking at cases individually. We're, we're wanting to rubber stamp 50-50. Nothing could be further from the truth. Right now, we have a rubber stamp of every other weekend all across the country. That's the rubber stamp. What we're saying is justice should be blind. Walking into that courtroom, both parents should be presumed to be fit, willing, and able. If you have a driver's license, you're presumed to be a good driver. Now, if you get a, a DWI, you can have that license taken away, but you're not presumed to be a, a drunk driver every time you get in your car. Well, by the mere fact that you had a child, you should be presumed to be a good parent unless proven otherwise. So the court needs a threshold before they just rip a parent out of a child's life. And that's what we're talking about is you're presumed equal. We still have discretion that a judge can waiver on that. But can you imagine how much more time would be spent on the cases that need a judge if we could clear the courtrooms of 80% of the cases that are just, you know, stirred up by an attorney trying to rack up some billable hours? It's just, it's unbelievable. I just, I, uh, I can't wait for that day when, you know, you get your 50-50. You don't even have to fight for it. You know, it is the default that you get to do. And the thing is, sadly, I mean, I know of judges that are, that are, that keep pointing to, it's not that I don't care about the parents' rights. It's what's best for the child. Mm -hmm. um, and they keep pointing to that. And I said, you know, that's great, but you get that, that both parents, if treated equally and with, with equity, it's going to create the neutrality that the child needs, the perfect environment for the child to thrive. Yeah, because what, what, you know, the fallacy of their argument is best interest of the child. Well, wait a minute here. The father's attorney is working for the father. The mother's attorney is working for the mother. If someone commits murder, a, an attorney is, you know, is tasked with the responsibility of getting them, even if they know that person's guilty, they're going to find any loophole to get them off the hook. Why? Because their responsibility is to that client. Well, right now what happens is nobody's truly being paid by the child. Even if they claim there's a guardian ad litem, nobody's truly looking out for the child. Who they're looking out for, who's paying the bill. So the father's paying one attorney, the mother's, so there is no such thing as best interest of the child right now. There's best interest of whoever's paying the attorneys is what's happening right now. And in many cases, the guardian ad litems all they are looking at is the net worth of each parent. And they're saying exactly. the best interest of the child <clears throat> is based on any differential with the net worth of the parent. 
So exactly. for many parents in the courtroom, it's like bringing a knife to a gunfight. Exactly. Good analogy. It's really sad. It's like, it, you know, yeah, I can't really blame the attorneys because they are working for the other parent, and, or, you know, for that parent. And, and, but it's just so sad. It's, you know, a parent saying, I want my 50 and I want their 52. And, and the, the uh, challenge is, and I, I've, I've talked to a lot of CPS workers in Missouri that, that tell me, they say, you know what, Mark, if, if I hear of an allegation of abuse, if I'm aware that they're in the middle of the custody battle, I know for a fact nine out of 10 of those are going to be false allegations used to gain the upper hand in the custody battle. Now, the real tragedy is which one of those is the one that really needs help? And unfortunately, there's a lot of cases where people aren't getting the help. And that's what's happening right now. People talk about that each case should be looked at individually. Well, can you imagine if we could clear the courtrooms of the cases that really don't need a judge? There's going to be some kids out there that really are needing a judge to look at that case in depth. And they don't have the time because the, there's such a backlog of cases that really could be settled by saying, okay, there's nothing drastically wrong. Yeah, we hate each other, but too bad. Let's suck it up and learn how to get together. Now the judges can really focus on those cases where there might be some serious things going on, but they don't have the time right now. Yeah, and it's interesting. I, I've, I mediated cases where actually, when there's an attorney present, it becomes such a divisive situation that we're not quite sure that they're going to come to an agreement because you've, they've got the, their attorney in their ear saying, don't trust them. Don't trust what they're saying. You know, um, well, it just from an attorney standpoint, they don't want to settle because if they settle, that means their billable hours stop on that day. If they mm -hmm. can keep rallying you up and, hey, I think we can get a little more. Hey, I think we can get a little more. Well, great. There's another $300 an hour every time they say they think they can get you a little more. That's just, it's unbelievable. And, um, and I am determined that with unity, that we're going to make a difference for the best interest of families and, uh, you know, restore families, restore them. Um, and I'm so excited. I cannot wait for you to get down here to Central Florida to go to the conference at the end of April, April 24th and 25th. We, um, it's probably the most diverse conference that um, I've put on for sure. And uh, in having voices from all areas of, um, you know, that are in, affected by parental alienation and high conflict custody situations. So. Yeah, I'm excited that you're putting on. I'm glad, I'm glad to go to Florida too. I tell you what, <laughs> some, of these, yeah. some of these states that asked me to come up there, not putting the states down, by the way, Tom Pischke, but. Uh, I don't know if you heard, but last year I went to testify for a South Dakota bill, and uh, this is not an exaggeration. The temperature on the day of the hearing, with the wind chill was minus 32 on the day of the hearing. That is not an exaggeration. Oh, wow. And uh, it, it was is something you know. Sometimes uh, hearings are scheduled, and you don't get a big leeway. And there wasn't time for me to get a plane, so I literally rented a car and drove a car 21 hours in a snowstorm uh, that had rear the Enterprise, bless their heart, thought they were doing me a favor and gave me a 300 Chrysler, or whatever, that apparently is rear wheel drive. Ooh. So I was a sled the whole time. So I'm excited to come down to Florida and uh, have a little bit of a treat there instead of going to South Dakota. Sorry, Tom, about that. But uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to miss baseball season. We have this is spring training month. Yeah. I love it. Mm -hmm. But next month is really great too because. Uh, you know, it's before the heat wave starts hitting Florida. So I'm sure it's perfect. So everybody come to Florida, come to Florida, April 24th and 25th for the Guardians and Gatekeepers Conference. Meet all of these amazing, this amazing lineup of speakers. Uh, we're gonna be talking about legislative things with, with Mark Ludwig. We're going to be talking about um, how it impacts the schools and how it impacts families. We're gonna try to touch on all the bases with all of our experts. And we'll have an opportunity, a panel discussion, so that you can actually ask the questions to these professionals and these uh, experts. So I, um, I look forward to it. Thank you, Mark, thank you for your time. Well, I, once again, I appreciate both of you guys uh, very much. Like I said, we're all a team and no one is better than anyone else. We're all a team that each has different you know, assets and resources. And, and I appreciate the two of you for filling gaps that, that I definitely uh, wouldn't be able to fill. <laughs>
Yeah, Anne's been like my right hand person. She has been uh, just taking the bull by the horns and uh, and to do everything she can to make this an amazing, impeccable event that that uh, that is flawless and I, uh, definitely a godsend. And all of these people are arising because we all have been touched in some way by parental alienation or high conflict custody situations. So um, yeah, join the family. Yeah, uh, well, thank you so much for joining us with Custody Matters Live. We will see you again next Wednesday night. Have a great evening.